Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the Gospel of John, the themes in the Gospel of John. And this is lesson number 10 in that series for December 7 of 2024, entitled The Way, The Truth, and The Life. And by now, we should all know who that refers to, right? Mm -hmm. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have seen already in the Gospel of John so many wonderful truths, so many good themes. Help us to continue to enjoy and encompass and, and, and incorporate into our lives the things we are learning is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jim? Well, the Bible study guide, the Gospel of John is divided into four main sections. It is the prologue, John 1, 1 to 18, and the book of signs, John 1, 19 to 12, 50. The book of glory, John 13, 1 to 20, 31 and the epilogue, John 21, verses 1 to 25. Our study of the themes of the Gospel of John so far has <clears throat> focused mainly on the prologue and the book of signs, laying out who Jesus, via his miracle signs, dialogues, and teachings, the lessons now shift particularly to the third section of John, the book of glory. <clears throat> Interestingly, the famous seven I am statements form a bridge across the book of signs and the book of glory. These are, I am, the bread of life. John 6, 35, 41, 48, and 51, I am the light of the world. <coughs> John 8, 12, John 9, 5, I am the door. John 10, 7 and 9, I am the good shepherd. John 10, verses 11 and 14, I am the resurrection and the life, John 11:25. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. And I am the true vine, John 15, 1 and 5, all from the Bible study guide. Okay, I'm going to ask you a trivial question. Oh, not trivial, but a, an overall question here. Um, do you have to be divine to do all those things? We have suggested that the expression I am is a code word for God. The word Yahweh in Hebrew is a verb that means the closest thing we have in English is, is to be. So it would be the eternal one, the self-existent one. People have translated it in various ways. But, okay, he's all of these things. So let's see what we can make of that. Jesus described himself in a number of different ways using the words, I am. We understand, so do you, do you think any of the people who heard him using those words understood what he was talking about when he said that? What, I mean, in terms of this being a reference to God? Those in the Sanhedrin did not understand it at least the first two times that he used it in his speech near the end of his life. And finally, the, the third, third one, time, they tried to stone him. He said, before Abraham was, oh, yeah. I am. Oh, yeah, okay, where's the stone? Let's <laughs> just stone you. Wow. Anyway, when Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one goes to the Father except by him, does that apply also to all the people who died at the times of the Old Testament? What did they know about Jesus? Or should we say, what do they know about Christ? I'm not trying to make you, things difficult for you today. <laughs> well, did, um, did David know what he was writing when he wrote uh, chapter 22? Yeah. Or Isaiah 53? I, I think at least Isaiah knew that someone was coming. Yeah. David, I'm not sure, but I think Isaiah knew that. Yeah, David. David was told by God that if you if you if you be faithful, you know the Messiah will come in your in your lineage. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
In this lesson, we will focus on Jesus' farewell messages to the disciples in the upper room. And where is that found? John 13 to 17. John 13 to 17, and then talk more about the implications of his statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we're going to give you a warning about what we're going to try to accomplish here today. John chapter 13, 1 through 17. It was now the day before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to his Father. He had always loved those in the world who were his own, and he loved them to the very end. Jesus and his disciples were at supper. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the thought of betraying Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God. Now so, let me interrupt for just a second here. How did Jesus know that? We're going to see a very interesting quotation coming up here that speaks specifically that Jesus every night spent at least a portion of the night and in some cases all night long talking with his father about what they were going to do the next day. So how does he get to know his father? Spends time with him. Spends time with him. Hmm? Time in prayer. Yep. Go ahead. Callous knees uh, softens the heart, huh? Yeah. But, so, okay. sorry, but, but I mean, in verse three in, in New, New King James says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and uh -huh. was going to God. Yes. So he, he knew. Yes. That he was going. How did he, I'm asking you how he knew that. God had to have shown him. Yeah. This was conversations with the Father. So, there wasn't, there wasn't question in his mind on the cross then, was there? Well, th what was going on in the, on the cross was the, the, key battle in the great controversy. Satan was trying to force his ideas in Jesus' head just as fast as he could. He says, you know, if you die this second death, the Father, you know, the Father will abandon you completely because he's so opposed to sin. You will never, you'll never rise from this situation. And yet Jesus said, I'm sorry, I know my Father. I reject your accusations against the Father. And he was victorious. He relied on the evidence previously given to him uh, about the Father's character and so forth. And much of that was in Jesus understanding the Bible that he had probably memorized. Much of it, yeah. Um, and we're going to come down here. We're going to see God was his instructor. Mary wrote... <coughs> And I don't know exactly how that worked because theoretically they were a poor family. There's no way they could have owned any portions of scripture. I, and, and theoretically, from what we know from those times, Mary should have not been able to read. But somehow, rather, unless, and again, Gordon's point, maybe they had it all, maybe she had it all memorized. And how, I mean, how could she have had without education. Women didn't get education in those days. So there's some mystery in here that we don't fully understand. Anyway. And, and yet, by faith alone, he knew that he was God. Mm -hmm. By faith, because he had no advantage over us. Okay, think about this now. And I'm, 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 I want to do this respectfully. Could I convince you Anyone in this our group here, could I convince you by telling you enough times that you're God? No. no. Okay, I hope not. <laughs> well, it, depends. So, it depends what word you're going to use. If you go to, uh, I think John, well, you're uh, God. Jesus says, I said you're gods, and they go back to uh, uh, Psalms 82, yeah. uh, six, uh, 1 to but, 7 or there. It says you're gods, and you're going to die like men, you're going to die like princes. So, yeah. But the point is, did, did, 
did those words make them gods? They acted in the place. Those, were, those yeah. words were about the judges who, who dealt with cases in those days, and they, they dealt with people's lives. They acted in the place of God. It didn't make them gods. Right. They died. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Go ahead. What verse are you on now? Verse 4. Verse 4. So he rose from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel around his waist. Then he poured some water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Ah, are you going to wash my feet, Lord? Jesus answered, you do not understand now what I'm doing, but you will understand later. Peter declared, never at any time will you wash my feet. Okay, who's supposed to be washing the feet? Servant. The servant. A, technically a slave. I mean, let's be, be honest. We're trying to, normally that would be the work of a slave. Okay, go ahead. If I do not wash your feet, Jesus answered, you will no longer be my disciple. Simon Peter answered, Lord, do not wash only my feet, then wash my hands and head too. Jesus said, those who have had the bath are completely clean and do not have to wash themselves except their feet. All of you are clean, all except one. I'm going to interrupt for again for just a second. Who was it that washed Jesus' feet and his hands and his head? Later on, not here. No, before this. Earlier. Mary, Mary, Mary yeah. did. Mary. Yes. Exactly. She washed his, yes. all that with, tears. with perfume. Yes, and her tears. Yeah. That was a few days before this, though. A few days before this. Yes. Go ahead. In Simon's home, I think. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> You will no longer be my disciple. Simon Peter answered, Lord, do not wash my feet, then wash my hands and head too. Jesus said, those who have had a bath are completely clean and do not have to wash themselves except for their feet. All of you are clean except one. Jesus already knew who was going to betray him. That is why he said, all of you except one are clean. After Jesus has washed his feet, he put his outer garment back and returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I have just done to you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and it is right that you do so, because that is what I am. I, your Lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you so that you will do just what I have done for you. I'm telling you the truth. Slaves are never greater than the teacher or than the master. Messengers are never greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice, American Bible Society, 1992. Practice being a slave. I, I, this is what really sets Christianity apart from mm -hmm. many other religions, many, all the other religions. Yeah. How beautiful. Uh, so many times we take it for granted, but it is such a beautiful act. Such a beautiful act. Jesus taught not only by words, but also by example. As he washed the feet of his disciples when they were arguing over they were arguing over who would be greatest in the new kingdom, which they thought Jesus was about to establish. Mm. I mean, that's just... Certainly no one who is honored in an earthly kingdom could be expected to wash the feet of anyone. However, Jesus demonstrated what we should do. John 13, 15. Dwayne? I have set an example for you so that you will do just what I have done for you. Try to imagine having your feet washed by God. Jesus knelt down and washed the feet of his disciples, including the feet of Judas, who Jesus knew was about to betray him. Judas resented the fact that Jesus was willing to wash even his dirty feet. It led him to proceed with his plan to go and betray Jesus. So if you read Ellen White's chapter on Judas, there are a number of times when Jesus said, 
I know what, I know what needs to happen here. We need to make Jesus the king so he can help us conquer the Romans. And he, he, he would say, okay, we need to do this, and Jesus would do something else. We need to do this? No, Jesus would do something else. And Jesus, Judas was becoming very, very frustrated. Okay. So he finally said, I've got to take it in my own hands. Yep. I've got to force him to, to become king. Right. Peter was embarrassed to have Jesus wash his feet and tried to back out of that ceremony. But then when Jesus explained that anyone who was not washed would not have a part with him, Peter wanted to be washed all over. Now, of course, why are they washing the feet in this case? The dusty feet. Dusty and maybe even muddy feet outside. And you come into someone's house and they're trying to keep a clean house. And you come in with your muddy feet. And what does your mom say? Take off those shoes or clean your feet before you come walking in with that mud, right? So that's basically what's happening here. Um, why do you suppose so many Christians today do not carry out the foot washing ceremony despite Jesus' clear instructions to do so? It's not... Well, it's one of the many things that, that, that most Christians ignore, like the mm -hmm. Sabbath. Yeah. Washing feet. A couple it, examples. It is uncomfortable for us as selfish human beings to kneel down and wash another's feet. But when we refuse to do that, basically we are saying, we do not like the kind of God that Jesus revealed. Ooh. What kind of God washes dirty feet? Would your God do that? After washing the feet of the disciples, Jesus continued. John 13, verses 18 to 20. I am not talking about all of you, I know those I have chosen, but the scripture must come true that says, quote, the man who shared my food turned against me. I tell you this now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Now I'm going to interrupt here for just a second. Jesus says this at least three times in this upper room experience. I tell you now so not so you can write tomorrow's newspaper, but I tell you now so that when it happens, something I predict, when it happens, oh, he said so. He knew about it. He knew about it. He knew about it. And what does that mean, of course? He's God. Go ahead. Continuing verse 20, I am telling you the truth. Whoever receives anyone I send receives me also. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. That is, okay. receives God, him, the Father himself. We can be certain that the fact that Jesus knew in advance that Judas was to be the one who betrayed him was one of the proofs of his divinity. Jesus slipped in some words that perhaps did not really sink into the disciples' thinking, saying, in effect, when all these things that are, I am warning you about happen, then what? You will, you will believe I am who I am. In other words, the fact that I predicted it now and it happens later and you see that happen several times and you're saying, this is not human behavior. Do you think the disciples at that time caught on that I am who I am? The, the, the Sanhedrin didn't understand it no. until the third time. And at some point in time, the disciples obviously started to get it. But I think it was after the this resurrection. Was, yeah. This is even after John chapter twenty-one. Even uh, after the Lord was gone, they really yeah. that's when they realized. After the Emmaus road. Yeah. Yes. Soon after that, Jesus made a startling statement to them. From John thirteen, thirty-three to thirty-five, my children, I shall not be with you very much longer. You will look for me, but I tell you now that I what I told the Jewish authorities. You cannot go where I am going. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Okay. Whoa. Yeah. Was Jesus stating 
that everyone on this earth is inherently selfish? Is that why loving people stand out? Because of, because of the contrast to others? Yeah. What, what do those words say? By nature, we are human beings, we're selfish. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that humans can be turned into loving beings. Amen. His disciples must have been in a state of panic when he told them that he was going away. John 13, 33. However, almost immediately, Jesus gave the, those immortal words found in John 14, 1 through 3. And I think we better, uh, we better read that. <coughs> it's coming up just okay, a yeah, later. Yeah. yeah. Many of us grew up reading and even hearing songs quoting John 14, 1 through 3 and, in the King James Version as saying that Jesus will prepare mansions for us and then he will take us to those mansions in heaven to live with him forever. But what does it actually say? Let me read from the King James. Jesus promised the disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. And my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And hopefully every one of you could recite those words by memory. Yes. Some it's, of us might be able to sing what the King's Herald said, yes. those, those words. It is important to notice that in the Greek, the word mansions, which is in the King James Version, is not talking about large, spacious, expensive houses. The word translated mansions in King James Version simply means rooms as in an inn. Jesus wants to dwell with us in the same physical space. So the point of talking about making mansions is not to say, I want to build you big fancy houses. The, the point is saying, I want to live with you. I want to dwell with you. These words of Jesus are more correctly translated in the Good News Bible as John 14. Um, Jim, I'm going to ask you to do that. I just did the other, the King James. John 14, 1 to 3. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go pre to pre excuse me, after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. Good news Bible. Okay, so we don't know what that mansion what those mansions, quote mansions are going to be like. But uh, we're going to live together with God. Maybe they're pods. <laughs> yeah. The Greek form of his promise in John 14 too makes it certain that he definitely will come again and he definitely will take us to heaven. What is the basis for the confidence in that promise? Many would say the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, that is uh, certainly true. But John chapter 14, verse 3, the basis is stated clearly, uh, differently. In this verse, I will come is actually in the present tense in Greek. I am coming. This is, this is a use of the present tense in Greek called the futuristic present. It is a future even spoken in with such a certainty that it is described as though already happening. Thus, it is far fair to translate the phrase as, I will certainly come again, adult Sabbath yeah. school, <coughs> Bible study guide. Now we've, <coughs> when we look at that, we try to interpret it, we must remember that this is Greek, mm. that the one who wrote this, John, Greek wasn't his primary language. He's translating something that Jesus said in Aramaic, but I think it's still valid. The second coming of Jesus is based on absolute certainty, not just because it is prophesied in the Bible, but because the one who is truth tells us himself. That's what matters. <coughs> Excuse me. After all, there was no reason for Jesus to come the first time if he does not plan to come back. After spending years with Jesus, the disciples had come to depend upon him for virtually everything. 
to be told that he was going away and that they could not go with him was very troubling to their hearts. However, Jesus was looking forward to a time when sin itself and all things connected with sin will be destroyed. Dwayne, I think that's here. Daniel 7.27 The power and greatness of all the kingdoms on earth will be given to the people of the Supreme God. Their royal power will never end, and all rulers on earth will serve and obey them. So Jesus, after basically quoting that idea, continued John 14, 4. You know the way that leads to the place where I am going. Good News Bible. Okay, what questions would you have popped into your mind right at that point in the discussion in the upper room? John. Probably, probably Thomas's question, right? Yes. John 14, 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not want know where you are going, so how can we know the way to get there? Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. Now, I, I want you to think about that for a second. Were their minds spinning at that point? I mean, what, what they're expecting from Jesus is okay, is there some place in Galilee you want us to meet us? You know, you want us to meet you. Tell us, we'll, we'll go there. And Jesus says, no, I am the way. Huh? Yeah, they, they hadn't gotten it yet. This is, this is in the setting of the last day they have with him. They're in the upper room, but they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Jesus washes their feet. And then this, I'm going. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I'm going away. So then he does a very interesting thing. Our Bible study guide describes it like this. We may observe an interesting progression in how Jesus describes himself as the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. Consider the sequence of these three words. Jesus is the way. And we walk, we learn, as we walk, we learn the truth from him, which eventually leads us to life abundant in this world and in the eternal world to come. Notice that the sequence was Christ's response to Thomas's question about the way to pursue in John 14, 5. We may wonder why Thomas made this query considering Jesus' clear explanation in the previous verse. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Hmm. Obviously, if someone says, I say, I'll, I'll meet you in Timbuktu, you, you know how to get there. And you would say, uh, hold on. Which flight should I take? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, to Jesus, it was, I'm sure Jesus knew what he was talking about. But to them, I'm sure it was yeah. shaking their heads. Does it seem to you that even today Jesus is the way? Well, the dis discussion continued. Oh, I guess this is mine. John 14, 7. Now that you've known me, he, Jesus said to them, you will know my father also. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Good news Bible. Then after Thomas got things started, Philip expressed an obvious quandary. Jim? John 14, 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father. That is all we need. Good news Bible. Now, Jesus has just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, where are you going? I am the way. The way to what? The way to the Father. Okay, so the next obvious question was, okay. Show the Father. Show us the Father. Okay. Jesus was obviously disappointed that Philip did not seem to understand that he was revealing to them the Father. What had Jesus done to reveal the Father to them? John chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. Jesus answered, for a long time I have been with you all, yet you do not know me, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Why then do you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe, Philip, that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I have spoken to you, Jesus said to his disciples, do not come from me. The Father who remains in me does his own work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If not, believe because of these things I do. Good news, Bible. 
Now, how many things had Philip seen Jesus do at this point in time? What Years old. Oh. Isaiah 6, 9. It's coming 9, 6. Yeah. He's known as a wonderful counselor, mighty God, God yeah. everlasting father, yeah. prince of peace. Yeah. Who's left out? Well, I mean, the, the, po the, po the point of that is that have they grasped the idea that those words apply to this human being that there's, that's sitting next to us? That's, that's the challenge. No, and I agree with, I'm not arguing with the point, but it, it, it's a, I mean, I can understand why some of these things take a bit of a stretch. <laughs> also, we're, we're, th we're expecting, how much time did Philip have in, in, in Bible study, what we call, yeah. ha access to, the, to yeah. the books or the scrolls or whatever? No, but they walked with him. He, I understand, he broke but his heart. Broke we know his heart. that he did, they didn't understand it until after he'd they already were, died. Yes, Wait, yes okay? because they so, were expecting a worldly had a different Kingdom. paradigm. There you are. They had, and it takes time to educate. The hardest thing is to unlearn the exactly, misinformation the that, are wrong. that we were raised with. But they were educated very quickly. How long did, did it take for James to be beheaded? Yeah. Not too long. No. And, you know, if you look at this, Ellen White says, Jesus chose unlearned fishermen. Yeah unlearned in the ways of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. Yeah. But yet they did they go to, the, they did go. Didn't have a deep understanding of that paradigm. Well, and the question is, how much of the scripture were they able to, had they memorized? Well, if you listen to Randy's sermon recently, which yeah. I'm sure you did, he said, everyone learned the books of Moses. They were supposed memorized to. Memorized the books of Moses. A few, memorize the whole rest of the Old Testament. Yeah, that blows me away. Yeah, how, many, how many of us have memorized? Even in the recent past, one of my Jewish med school friends memorized the Pentateuch, but was one of the most godless guy <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I, I can tell you, I've never tried any of the Old Testament, but there was a time I memorized the book of James and the book of Romans. Wow. It's a challenge, but it, it really, I mean, when you've done that and you've reviewed it, it makes a difference. Yes. Try to imagine yourself exposed to the ideas given to the disciples that they were walking around every day working with someone who looked like an ordinary human being. However, he lived and acted and spoke as God. And he was but we know that his divinity was veiled, more or less veiled. So Jesus, me, and so Ellen White has that interesting expression, divinity shown through humanity. What did that look like? Sometimes divinity flashed through humanity. So Jesus made it clear that his main task during his first coming was to make the Father known. Jesus himself, as implied by the Greek in John 1, 18, said that he was here to explain and interpret and bring the correct and full meaning to our relationship with God. Would this be uh, acceptable to you if I said, the book that really, really helps me have a beautiful picture of our Heavenly Father is the book of John? Yeah, clearly. We have discussed in the past the idea that Jesus spent a portion of it each night, in some cases the entire night, talking with his father in preparation for what was going to happen the next day. And one of the obvious examples of that is Luke 6, 12, the night before he chose his disciples, they, he spent the entire night in prayer. Were those close conversations with the father one of the ways that Jesus was able to so fully represent the father to us? Is it possible and even mandatory that we learn about God by <coughs> studying the life of Jesus? Do we believe that the Father is just like the Son? Okay. There's the question. Do we believe that? Okay, where are we now? Who's next? Dwayne, I think it's yours. In the writings of Ellen G. White, had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling his glory, humbling himself, that humanity might look upon him, 
the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding its record of his own condescending grace. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. So the question we're asking ourselves is, how long did it take the disciples to recognize that? After he left them. Okay. After he left and then, uh, well, after he was crucified. Yes. And, and raised to life and so on. Yeah. John 16, 25 to 27, Jesus said, I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. When that day comes, and he was implying it's now, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask for him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you to think about something. Jesus has just basically turned over the entire Old Testament sacrificial system, priestly system. He just said, we don't need it anymore. And to proof of that, what happened to the curtain in the middle of the temple? Ripped. Torn from top to bottom. Well, my mentor, Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, told the story many times of being in a meeting with many senior Seventh-day Adventist ministers when John 16, 25 to 27 was read without the word not in verse 26, as is so often done unconsciously to fit the incorrect paradigm many have that Jesus must ask the Father on our behalf. One minister stated that to say that Jesus is not pleading for us before the Father is heresy, and that it, if Jesus is not pleading for us, we all will be eternally lost. That very view misstates what the Bible teaches. And of course, it contradicts what we read in Zechariah 3, 1-5. But it is the paradigm of so many. Yes. Including many Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. Including many Seventh-day Adventist ministers. Yes. Do we believe that we can approach the Father directly without any interceding person or being, even Jesus himself, between us? The children of Israel begged Moses to stand between themselves and God. Note that God of, note that the God of the Old Testament was Christ himself. It was certainly not God's idea that they needed an inter intercessor between himself and them. But let's look at the words. Exodus 20, 18 to 21. When the people heard the thunder and the trumpet blast and saw the lightning and the smoking mountain, they trembled with fear and stood a long way off. Does that mean they turned around and ran? They were frozen in <laughs> their tracks. They okay. said to Moses, if you speak to us, we will listen, but we are afraid that if God speaks to us, we will die. That's why they were frozen. They couldn't, they couldn't <laughs> even run. <laughs> Moses replied, don't be afraid. God has only come to test you and to make you keep on obeying him <clears throat> so that you will not sin. But the people continued to stand a long way off, and only Moses went near the dark cloud where God was. Are we still begging for someone, a priest or some kind of being, to plead with the Father on our behalf? And of course, we know the largest Catholic, I mean, sorry, the largest Christian organization. You have to go to the human priest and confess your sins. Jesus himself said it is not necessary from the verses we just read. Some major churches teach that one cannot pray directly to the Father. They say that one must confess sins to a human intermediary and must pray to a saint who then transmits the message to God, or maybe Mary. Are you comfortable with the idea that Jesus adequately revealed the Father to us? Does studying the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ lead you to understand the truth about God? John 1, 14 to 17. Let's go back there to that first chapter. 
the Word became a human being and full of grace and truth lived among us. We saw His glory, the glory which He received as the Father's only Son. John the Baptist spoke about Him. He cried out, This is the one who was, I was talking about when I said, He comes after me, but He is greater than I am because He existed <laughs> before I was born. Out of the fullness of His grace, He had blessed us all, giving us one blessing after another. God gave the law through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And the but in there is supplied. It's not, not in the original. John 1 makes it very clear that Jesus is the truth. By contrast, John 8, 44 makes it very clear that the devil is, was, is a liar from the beginning. So let's see the contrast here, James, Jim. John 8, 44, Jesus said to the <coughs> Jewish religious leaders, you are children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. From the very beginning, he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells you a lie, he is only doing what is natural to him because he is a liar and the father of all lies. Okay, and shortly thereafter, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Did they throw stones at him because of what he said in Daniel, I mean in John 8, 44, or because of what he said in John, in John 8, 56, or whatever, whatever the uh, verse, um, both maybe, huh? Yeah. I mean, imagine standing up between, before the religious leaders of the nation and saying, you are of your father, the devil. And besides that, I am God. Uh, <laughs> By then he had them so... Apoplectic. Yes. <laughs> Cataplectic. Mm -hmm. Well, they were ready to grab stones. Why do you think those words are spoken about the Sanhedrin and to the Sanhedrin? Why do you think it is that our world is turning away from the truths of the Bible? Ellen White, there are many who are crying out for the living God, longing for the divine presence. Philosophical theories or literary essays, however brilliant, cannot satisfy the heart. The assertions and inventions of men are of no value. Let the word of God speak to the people. Let those who have heard only traditions and human theories and maxims hear the voice of him whose word can re renew the soul unto everlasting life. Ellen White, Christ of the Ecclesiastes. Wow. Let us hear the words of God. Let us hear God speaking to us. Mm. What is implied by the fact that everything that has been created was created by Jesus Christ? Dwayne? For through him, God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. God created the whole universe through <coughs> him and for him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him, all things have their proper place. Okay. C.S. Lewis so aptly stated, and this is my interpretation of his statement, <coughs> that it is only by Jesus the truth that we are able to interpret anything and the world around us correctly. And here's actual C.S. Lewis's statement. Gordon? Quoted in the Bible Study Guide, if believe, no, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, <laughs> not because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. That, that's just an amazing statement. I just love that. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. So what's he trying to say to us? Everything around us, everything we see and do and say should be interpreted in light of our relationship to God. Is it clear to you that the entire Bible from Genesis to, Re Genesis to Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ? Well, what did he say about that? In John 5, 38 to 40, and 46 and 47. And you, this is verse 38, 
and you do not keep his message in your hearts, for you do not believe in the one whom he sent. You study the scriptures because you think in them you will find eternal life. But these very scriptures speak about me. Now, let me interrupt for a second. Remember that, as we've suggested already, the Jews were taught that if you memorize a chunk of scripture, that's like your ticket to heaven. But there, it wasn't in their hearts yet. Okay. And verse 40, yet you are will, not willing to come to me in order to have life. <clears throat> if you had really believed Moses, you would have believed me because he wrote about me. I can't imagine them just sitting there and going, what? Yeah, exactly. You? Yeah, you. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how can you believe what I say? Yeah, and they're just about ready to say, you're not even 50 years old yet. Yeah. And Luke 24, 13 through 44, we don't have time to read that right now, make it very clear in Jesus' own words that the entire Bible is about him. And what, what are those <laughs> verses about, do you remember? That was the time the two men were walking to Emmaus, Cleopas and his friend, and what happened? Stranger walked up. Some stranger walked up and walked along with them and started. Don't you know what's been going on? <laughs> Don't you know what's been <laughs> happening in Jerusalem these last few days? Wow. And he, and then he, what did he do? Gave them a Bible study. He, he laid out the truths about himself from the Old Testament. That's what he did. Jesus himself. Why don't we have that conversation recorded explicitly? Yeah. Oh, We'll get to see it someday. Yeah. Yeah. A little I, too late. I think we actually have it recorded in all the sermons that that the that I suspect, Stephen and others yeah. gave I suspect in subsequent this was, days. This was the format for many, many sermons that from that day to this. But I wish we had the original. Jesus himself and the apostles repeatedly said that his life fulfilled the prophecies from the Old Testament. In Matthew 22 and Luke 1 and Acts 116. Um, let me look, we, I think we can look at a couple of these really short verses. Matthew 22, 31. Now as for the dead rising to, the, rising to life, haven't you ever read what God uh, has told you? He said, and so forth. Luke 1, sorry. Luke 170, he promised to his holy prophets long ago in Acts 116, my fellow believers, he said, the scriptures had to come true in which the Holy Spirit, speaking through David, made a prediction about Judas, who was the guide to those who arrested Jesus. So they clearly believed that the Old Testament was a prediction of what's coming in, in the life of Jesus. The Bible is not a textbook on science. It does not explain how to split the atom or perform brain surgery, but it does something even more significant. It provides the context within which our universe has meaning. Why is that important? Is it important to have meaning in life? Absolutely, that's what our paradigms are based on, isn't it? It is a key that opens the door, the light that makes it possible to see. Without it, we would be in the dark about the existence of God, his role in the universe and our own origin, the meaning of life and the future. While science can determine many facts, it cannot tell us anything about history. Science cannot tell us that Abraham Lincoln was responsible for the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation being proclaimed. While it is a part of history, it cannot be proven in the laboratory. Okay, uh, where are we? Jim. Jim, I think that's yours. Ellen White says, when he spoke these words, I am the light of the world, Jesus was in the court of the temple, especially connected with the services of the Feast of Tabernacles. In the center of this court rose two lofty standards, supporting lampstands of great size. After the evening sacrifice,
All the lamps were kindled, shedding their light over Jerusalem. This ceremony was in commemoration of the pillar of light that guided Israel in the desert and was also regarded as pointing to the coming of the Messiah. At evening, when the lamps were lighted, the court was a scene of great rejoicing. Gray-haired men, the priests of the temple and the rulers of the people united in the festive dances to the sound of instrumental music and the chants of the Levites. Oh no, oh, dances uh, and sound of music in the temple? Yeah. Uh, well, in the church? What, what was that like? In okay. the illumination of Jerusalem, the people expressed their hope of the Messiah's coming to shed his light upon Israel, but to Jesus the scene had a wider meaning. As the radiant lamps of the temple lighted up all about him, so Christ, the source of spiritual light, illumines the darkness of the world. <coughs> Yet the symbol was perfect. Their great imperfect. light, imperfect. That great, yeah, Wimperk. I'm sorry. That great light, which his own hand has set to the in the heavens, was a truer representation of the glory of his mission. It was morning. The sun had just risen above Mount of Olives, and its rays fell upon the dazzling brightness of the marble palaces, and bright in the gold of the temple walls. When Jesus had Pointing to it said, I am the light of the world. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 463. The same is true about events recorded in scripture. We can determine if they are consistent with archeological evidence or other historical information. However, we cannot prove them by science. Science could never prove what happened on the cross or the resurrection or prove the eventual second coming. Would you like to see if you can do that in the, in the laboratory? The issues and outcomes of the great controversy and thus the truth about Lucifer, Satan, can never be proven by science. We can never understand why a perfect being such as Lucifer would choose to rebel against God even while living in God's presence in heaven. We might believe that it proves to us the truth about free will. In this lesson, we are led to believe that only Jesus has seen the Father. No other human being has seen the Father. Charles? John chapter 6, verse 46. This does not mean that anyone has seen the Father. He who is from God is the only one who has seen the Father. Good news, Bible. So how did Jesus himself learn about the Father? Who taught him? Here's a very interesting passage, Duane. The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things, the very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel. He was now taught at his mother's knee. Imagine that. What a concept. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. Hold on, what? God was his instructor. I thought it said his mother, but his mother was first, and came. God and the angels came along. If you read mm -hmm. more of Ellen White, yep. the angels instructed him. Jesus told his disciples that he was going away. However, he would not leave them without guidance. Uh, John 16, 26, and 50. 20, John 15, 26, and 27. The helper will come, the spirit who reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father, and he will speak about me. And you too will speak about me, because you have seen with, you have been with me from the very beginning. Good News Bible. Okay, Myra. Uh, John 16, 13. When, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all truth, into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of all things to come. It is a permissive and pluralistic society, uh, in a permissive and pluralistic society, which we live in, truth is a moving target, for it seems to keep shifting and evolving. What is truth today is not necessarily truth tomorrow. But Jesus in one sentence cuts through all of that and declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, John 14, 6, from our Teacher's Bible Study Guide. 
Read again the words that Jesus spoke to the Sanhedrin. Most of the Jews of Jesus' day memorized the books of Moses, and some memorized the entire known scriptures, the Old Testament. They were taught that just memorizing the scriptures assured them of eternal life and salvation. However, Jesus suggested otherwise. John 5, 38 to 40, Jesus said, you do not keep the message in your hearts, for you do not believe in the one who, whom he sent. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will have, find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me, yet you're not willing to come to me in order to have life. Isn't that interesting? So they study the scriptures saying, this is eternal life, mm -hmm. but that's not the, that's not the source. It's, it's Jesus, it's this eternal life. The scriptures mm -hmm. speak about Jesus. Jim, Bible study guide. Okay, the entire Bible testifies of the truth. Scripture is consistent and cohesive whole, for both Testaments have the same author, the Holy Spirit, the same leader claimed to have strongly, excuse me, to believe strongly in Moses, but they believe, disbelieved his testimony about Jesus, John 5, 46. The leaders claimed to believe in the Old Testament, however, they felt that a mere ascent to it guaranteed them eternal life. So memorize the Old Testament. If you could guarantee a place in, in, in heaven, would you memorize the book of Genesis? You bet. Oh boy. We would try. Uh, we might have a quick, uh, I don't want to take about 10 seconds. Many new translations omit John chap ver ver uh, chapter 5, verse 39. Mm -hmm. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. They are the very ones that testify me, of me. Many of these folk do not even believe that Christ is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And they are translating the scriptures. So it's important for us to choose which one we mm -hmm. buy. Did the Jewish leaders completely comprehend the idea that apart from Jesus, their only option was eternal death? Fortunately, we have two verses to tell us that some of those doubting Pharisees and Sadducees finally realized that Jesus was the answer. And I'll read just one of those, Acts 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests, who were mostly Sadducees, accepted the faith. And I guess Acts 15, 5, but some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and to told to obey the law of Moses. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, these absolutely foundational, amazing truths that we've had the opportunity of studying today give us pause. They make us think of large, large things. Help us to realize not only how all these things apply to us in our situation, but to the entire universe, because that's what God intends. We thank you for this chance to study together. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.